Welcome to all our young and not so young detectives. Thank you for joining another SciFest Africa event. For the first time in 24 years, the festival has gone completely virtual. We are embarking on a six month journey with two months left with events consisting of presentations, panel discussions, science shows and workshops amongst many others. The year's theme is Take Root Nurture and we are celebrating the International Year of Plant Health as proclaimed by the United Nations. The theme recognizes that plants constitute the foundation for all life on earth, ecosystem function, food security, um, and boosts economic development. The theme feeds into the 2030 agenda for sustainable development. Today, we are excited to bring you the fourth installment of our Discover workshop series, where the wonderful Tanya Reinhardt will walk us through fun and engaging live science demonstrations that parents and children can participate in using basic ingredients from home. Welcome everyone. Welcome to our Facebook Live viewers popping in as well. As always, these workshops are recorded and previous ones can be found on our website or Facebook as well. In case you haven't joined us before for these workshops, Tanya Reinhardt is the Science Center Coordinator at the Science and Technology Education Center at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. She was instrumental in establishing STEC in 2008 and has grown it from a science museum to a vibrant educational center for various levels. Apart from developing and delivering workshops, she also has a passion for science shows. Her love for rocks, gadgets, and experiments make her a frequent guest at events such as the Royal Show, Zulfest, and SciFest Africa. Her Germanic sense of humor and her passion for geology has won her awards as best workshop presenter at SciFest Africa in 2013, 2017, and 2019. She holds a diploma and a PhD in mineralogy from the Ruhr University, Bosham in Germany. Participation and questions are encouraged in these workshops. Please unmute if you have a question or if things are going too fast for you. Um, but please otherwise be sure to keep your microphone muted. On that note, Tanya, I'll pass on over to you. Thank you very much, Steph. And uh, welcome everybody to our fourth and um, I've been told not the last uh, Discover workshops and today we're going to embark on a mission to solve a crime online and I'm pretty sure that might be the first crime that is going to be solved online. How cool is that? Okay, and I'm going to dive straight into it. Share my screen. Okay, so we are at the Fake Town University. And my name is Tanya Reinhardt, as Steph said, and I work for the uh, Science and Technology Education Center at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. And, oops, sorry. And this is what you need. So you need paper to make notes, pencil and pen, hand cream or Vaseline, cello tape, scissor, large white plate, small straw pipette, uh, three teaspoons of bicarbonate, three teaspoons of salt, washing powder, three teaspoons, three teaspoons of cream of tartar, three te uh, teaspoons of flour, one glass red grape juice or red tea. Um, so for example, things like Woolies cranberry, but we need the tea, not just the tea bag, okay? Uh, to use it as indicator. You can also use turmeric and hand sanitizer with 70% alcohol. Right, so on January the 29th, just after lunch, a terrible crime happened at the University of Fake Town. A piece of chocolate cake disappeared. Careful investigation led to believe that it got eaten by, by a currently unknown suspect working at the university. Our victim Ms. Nalin Chipmunk, and I have to say all the names, um, we didn't want to disclose it, so we used fake names, okay, and um, also fake photos, so not that you suddenly somebody says, oh, I can't take a fingerprint from a, from a bobcat or something like this, okay. So our victim is Nalin Chipmunk, and she is Mrs. Turtle's PA and a college admin officer. And she was so looking forward to eat her self-made chocolate cake. And you, you have to picture this one, you know, with rich, dark chocolate on it this morning as a reward for her hard work during the week. When she came back from her break, the cake had disappeared. And our task is now to find out who ate the cake. So I went to Fake Town University 
and this is the scene of the crime, and this is Chipmunk's office, okay? And I collected evidence. The first evidence, three fingerprints that we found on the plate. The second evidence, a piece of paper with a message written in some kind of code. The third evidence, DNA samples that we took. And fourth, we found actually some white powder on the desk that we need to analyze. So these ones are our suspects. Um, and what you need to do is you need to make a table and I'm gonna show you the, just now how to make it. But first of all, let me introduce you the suspect. So suspect A is Professor Albert Mongoose and he's the DVC of the College of Affordable Entertaining Superintelligence or C's and is always concerned about staff happiness. Maybe this time it was his own happiness that he had in mind. Suspect B is Mark Turtle. He is the director of the professional service and he is basically the go-to man for everybody who needs anything. He is known to have a sweet tooth and loves a good cup of tea. So maybe he was unable to risk the chocolate cake. Suspect C. She is the public, that's Sally Fox, and she is the public relations manager with an affinity for making her staff very, very hard. And she's well known for her love for good food. A chocolate cake, you have to know, with coffee is her absolute favorite. So maybe she could not resist the chocolate cake. Suspect D, and I'll just have to hide my video panel. He uh, is Mandla Moose, and he is the chief financial manager and is a very active person who does cool dance moves and goes for long runs. And chocolate cake is well known to provide lots and lots of energy. So maybe he needed the extra calories for the next marathon. And last but not least, suspect E, which is Sharon Botcat. And she is the HR manager, and she always has her ducks in a row. She loves uh, looking after her pack, and she takes care of it. But maybe this time she wanted some chocolate cake for herself. Who knows? So uh, let me just try and see if I can. So based on the evidence collected, the question is who ate Miss Chipmunk's chocolate cake? So what we need to do now is um, to keep con uh, to basically keep track on um, who did what, well, who had a connection, who didn't have a connection based on the evidence, you need to make a table. So you have to have the victim. The reason why we put in the victim as well, because sometimes victims also leave kind of, uh, traces behind. So things like uh, um, fingerprints or DNA or something like this. So we always have to include the victim as well. So the victim, we have suspect A, which is Professor Mongoose, suspect B, Mr. M. Turtle, suspect C, Ms. A, uh, Dr. S. Fox, suspect D, Mr. M. Moose, and suspect E, S. Cat. And we have the evidence. Evidence one is the fingerprint, two, the secret message, three, the DNA, four, the white powder. And let's just go, it's going to show you. Okay, let me just, it's going to do a new share. And I'm going to go to my camera. Okay, so basically, how your table is going to look like. So you're going to take a sheet of paper. I have to put my glasses on, otherwise I'm not going to see. So you're going to make a paper. So we have evidence one, two, three, four. Okay, so that's number one. Fingerprints, you can write it down if you want. Number two, that is the secret message. Number three is our DNA. 
And number four is our secret, uh, uh, mystery powder. And then we have the suspect. So first of all, we need the victim. Her name was Nolin, so N. Chipman. We have suspect A, Prof A. Mongoose, suspect B is M. Turtle, suspect C, S. Fox, suspect D, M. Moose, and suspect E, S. Bobcat. Okay, so you should have a table like this. So whenever you have a match, so that there is a connection that we found evidence on the scene, what you're going to do is you're going to make a tick. So that looks like this, okay? If there is no connection, no evidence, you're gonna make a cross. This helps you to keep track of your, uh, of your findings. And it might help you also with identifying who the real culprit is. Okay, so let's start with our first evidence. But before we're gonna start with the first evidence, I actually want to show you something else. I want to show you how you can actually find your own fingerprint or uh, have a look at your own fingerprint. So for this, we need our hand cream. This is just to make your hands a little bit fattier, okay? You need a pencil, and I've got something special. I've got actually uh, something that's called graphite. Some paper, cello tape, a pair of scissors, just for cutting. Okay, so I want to collect my fingerprint of my index finger. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna rub with your pencil. So you're gonna rub it on a sheet of paper. And I'm actually gonna use my, my graphite because it's a little bit easier for me, okay? So you make it basically like as if you're gonna painting your, 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 your page black. Okay, so you've got a layer of graphite. In the next step, what you're going to do is you're going to find the beginning of your cello tape, which is always the worst problem. Okay. And you're going to place it like this. Okay. Then you're going to take a little bit of the cream. Don't take too much. Just dip your finger in. It helps uh, to, to make a little bit of a grease layer. So then you rub it between your fingers. Okay. And now you rub your finger on the pencil or graphite so so that your finger is getting really dirty mine is not really getting dirty i don't know why okay so maybe i'll just have to add a little bit more of graphite sorry you see this is this is always the case when you when you when you try things out so i hope that you were more successful Okay, so we're going to rub it, rub it, rub it. Okay, so now I'm going to put, so your finger should look like this. So really, really dirty. And now what you're going to do is, you're going to press your finger on your cello tape. I'm going to put it this sideways. So you're going to press your finger on the cello tape. And you're going to wiggle it a bit. And what you should get is a perfect fingerprint. So we're going to cut it out. And we can now stick it on a sheet of paper. And what you've got here is now your fingerprint of your index finger or which, whichever finger you took. Okay, so what you can do as well is just to make things a little bit bigger. So you can use a magnifying glass. If you don't have a magnifying glass, but you do have a cell phone with a camera, 
What you can also do is, I want the set to switch it on, sorry. So you can go to your camera app. Okay. And you can zoom in, enlarge it even a bit. Whoops, no, it doesn't. I had it very nicely here. Okay. And you can take a photo. Okay, I'm going to share the photo with you. And here's my fingerprint. You can even then enlarge it and you can have a look at your fingerprint. Okay, so thanks to technology, we don't really need any more hand lens. We can use a simple cell phone to basically investigate fingerprints. Okay, coming back to our case and our first piece of evidence. Okay, so here we have the three fingerprints that we collected. So uh, we tried to collect it also from the fork, but unfortunately this one was smudged and, was, uh, and we couldn't use it. So we have a partial fingerprint and two beautiful other fingerprints. And um, we took the fingerprints from our suspects. And so these ones are the fingerprint one, fingerprint two, and fingerprint three. And I give you about two minutes to check who do the fingerprints belong to. And what I would like you to do is when you have your table, just which fingerprints you found on the scene or uh, uh, which fingerprints are there, you're going to make a tick right next uh, underneath the name. So fingerprint a uh, fingerprint one, to whom does it belong to? Fingerprint two, to whom does it belong to? Fingerprint three, whose fingerprint is this? And as I said, I'm going to give you two minutes. And I'm pretty sure you probably already figured everything out. You don't really need the two minutes. Okay, and you can see that every fingerprint is very unique. So every fingerprint looks different. And this is, this is uh, something that is really, really important um, when, you, when you are at a crime scene. So fingerprint evidence, and it goes back way uh, a long, long, long time ago. Uh, somebody discovered that, you know, all the fingerprints in the world are different. So you have like whirly patterns, um, you have spirals, you have forks, and so on. And what happens is that uh, nowadays, everything is, is, of course, electronically. So you can scan in your fingerprint and you can compare it to a, a fingerprint database. And uh, they look for matching connections and see um, if they if they match up or not match up, and then they will basically show uh, the name of the suspect right next to it, if it's in the in the in the database. So we compare the collected prints when the prints taken for the victims and the suspect. So we have about thirty minutes, uh, thirty seconds left. All right, time's up. Okay, so let's have a look at the next evidence. So we've done the fingerprint. Let's look at the evidence of our secret message. And um, this is uh, the secret message is using um, an old, very old cipher. And this is what, what, what they call it, a cipher. Okay. So it's called a pig pen cipher or masonry cipher. It's very, very old. And what happens is that your letters are actually represented by symbols. So you've got squares. Um, you've got squares with dots, 
um, you've got like kind of triangles. So I've got an example here at the bottom. So the one where we're, um, and I'm gonna move my mouse pointer over it. I hope you can see this. So this one here is actually represents the letter U. So the first one represents the letter U. Okay, so maybe you can already figure out what the next one is. So it's, it's an open box with a dot in it. So we're going to look here. So these ones don't have dots. So these ones have dots and it's an open box. So therefore it is the letter K. This one here is, is like, looks like a roof with a dot in it. So the only roof that we have with a dot in it is a letter Z. And the full box with a dot in it, this is your letter N. So it is actually fairly simple. There are lots and lots of different kind of ciphers. Some are more complicated, some are more easier. So for example, a computer scientist or a mathematician will look into these kinds of uh, deciphering. And here is the message. So I'll give you um, three minutes and I hope that that's gonna be enough. Three minutes for you to decipher the message, to find out what the message actually says. And we're going to start now. And you should look, for example, if you can find names or initials. And time starts now. So this is also a good way for you to um, write secret messages. You can even come up with your own secret message that you or a secret code that you can share with your uh, with your friends. And you do hopefully notice that there's some coffee smudge on the note as well, or what looks like coffee. Maybe you want to make a note of that as well. So there's lots of other ciphers and um, probably one of the most um, most famous ciphers that they used during the Second World War was um, the uh, so-called, uh, they, they had a machine called the Enigma machine. And it was uh, only uh, thanks to a very fortunate uh, uh, circumstances and lots and lots of hard work that the uh, um, Allies were actually able to decipher um, the messages from this uh, from the enigma machine and it's a very complicated cipher this is this is very easy so you can do more complicated ciphers and the science that that is behind it it's called cryptography or encryption and we use encryption also when whenever you do a, a bank transaction um, you know, and and uh, uh, or you send some important documents that nobody else should should read, and so on. Um, also, these messages are encrypted, but they use a different encryption. Okay, you have forty seconds left. Otherwise, as everybody is finished, I'll, I'll leave it on uh, 30 seconds, just to give you some time to decode the message. Okay, and time's up. Right, so hopefully you got the message. So evidence number three is DNA. And in the last workshop, we already talked about DNA. So DNA can be used um, to identify if a person was present at a crime scene by collecting DNA samples. And we find DNA in 
things like saliva, blood, hair, sometimes even teeth, and so on. So this on the left hand side, you see the DNAs uh, from our victim, suspect A, suspect B, C, D, and E. And on the right hand side, there are some uh, DNA samples from the fork, the DNA on from the plate, and also DNA from the cake itself, because there were some crumbs left. So, and I give you two minutes to basically compare the DNA and find out which one of uh, the, the victim, the suspects, was basically or was in contact with the plate. Okay, so you see these dark lines and you have to find the matching lines and to find the right band. So it's just like uh, uh, basically comparing DNA, uh, comparing uh, patterns. So DNA is very, very useful. And nowadays, um, a lot of cold cases um, are solved now because um, they use DNA sampling or DNA evidence that has been have been collected at that time. But the, the basically the technology wasn't good enough. So a lot of uh, cases uh, can now be solved based on these DNA evidence. So you have a minute left. And don't forget to basically fill in your table. Um, it is very important that you basically record everything because um, once this thing comes, goes on to trial, okay, um, you need to say, okay, I've got this and this evidence and it links up to this and the suspect, okay? So very important to basically record everything. We've got 20 seconds left. And we can go to the next piece of evidence. So this involves a little bit more of your expertise because now we're going to basically investigate our powder. And uh, we collected some of the, uh, we, we collected, we were able to collect the, uh, some powder at the crime scene uh, that we can analyze here at Trade Town Lab. And I'm going to show you how it's going to look like. But you are going to, basically analyze all the other um, evidence from suspect A, we have flour, suspect B, washing powder, suspect C, bicarbonate, suspect D, cream of tartar, suspect E, salt. And we're going to do this together. Okay, so I've got Sorry, I've got all my powders here, which we collected from the offices. So this is this is some cake flour from suspect A. Okay. Suspect B, um, uh, it smells like washing powder. So that's from suspect B. This is from suspect E. So there was some bicarbonate somewhere in the office. So it says uh, sodium bicarbonate. Suspect D, uh, so there is some cream of tartar. And suspect E, we collected some salt from the office. Okay. So what we need is a plate. And what I've, I've done is, and what you should maybe also want to do is, I'm put labels on my plate so that I know which powder belongs to which suspect. And we are going to start off by using water. So first of all, what we need to do is, and remember how many uh, how many investigations do we need to do? We need to do like, um, uh, let's see, how many investigations? We need to do three investigations, one with water, one with our um, indicator, 
and one with vinegar. Okay, so I'm going to have some flour here. And I'm going to add some flour. Okay, I've got a spoon. So this belongs to suspect A. So I'm going to put a little bit suspect A, suspect A, suspect A. So all these ones here belong to suspect A. So that's the flower. Suspect B. This is the washing powder. And sorry, you shouldn't do this. You should actually choose, uh, uh, should take a new spoon because otherwise you're going to contaminate your, your powder. Sorry, I forgot. I need a new spoon. Okay. So this is also very important whenever you do forensics um, that you don't contaminate your evidence. So I've got A, B. There we go. That belongs to B. C. This is the bicarbonate. If you don't have a new spoon, you can always wipe it off. Okay, right. So we add a little bit of bicarbonate here, here, and here. Okay, so that's your bicarbonate of su from suspect C. Suspect D is cream of tartar. So I'm going to turn it around. So that's for suspect D. Here, here, and here. Okay. All right. And last but not least, suspect E, some sort. So this is from my suspect E. Okay, so in the next step, what we need to do is we need to find out how my samples react with specific things. So how does it react with water? So we're going to start with water, with sample A. If you have a straw, what you can do is you dip it in, okay? And then uh, let me just sorry, let me just write this one again. You dip it in, and then you close the top of your of your straw, and you can pull out some water. And if you want to release or add a drop, so you just kind of quickly open it. The problem is that often it comes a little bit too much out. So that's why I actually prefer to use something like this. This is a, a, a pipette. So how you basically work with it, you dip it into the water and you see that it's got a, it's got a, a, a thick end here. So you dip it into the water, you squeeze it. So you see bubbles coming up and then you release it under water and it sucks up some of the liquid into this uh, 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 thick part here. So now I can add, and this is water, so I can add water to it. And what we want to see is, we want to see if it dissolves. Uh, okay. So my A doesn't really look like as if it's going to dissolve. It's uh, not really. Maybe you come to a different conclusion. Okay. B. Let's see what B does. No, also not really. C, my bicarbonate. This one does dissolve. So it kind of disappears. Yes, yeah, it does dissolve. What does D do? And I'll just take this one here. 
Yeah, it also kind of looks like as if it's going to dissolve. And what does E do? Yes, it also dissolves. Okay, right? So I hope you came to the same conclusion. Okay. And uh, so this is for the water. So then you have the choice. You can either use red tea. You can choose red grape juice. Or you can make your own turmeric solution. I'll tell you just quickly how to do this. So this is this is the spice pot turmeric. And what you're going to do is you just add a, a few, a, a little bit, just the tip of your of your of your um, of your uh, teaspoon into a glass and um, you add 70% alcohol. Your hand sanitizer with glycerin should work as well. Um, so I used it and it, it worked for me. And you just swirl it. Please watch out. This stains horribly. So don't do this when you wear nice clothing because this is really nasty stuff. Okay, so whenever you use it, just watch out. So I'm going to use, I'm going to use uh, my grape juice and let's see what's going to happen. So if I'm going to add, okay, so I'm going to add some drops. Oops. Oh. And it doesn't really, here we go. So it doesn't do much. Maybe I'll just need to make a little well. So it doesn't, it doesn't do much. Okay, with A. So let's see what B does. Also not really, yeah, maybe a little bit of a blue color. A bluish color. Let's see what C does. Okay, also not really too crashing hot. So I think my, my red grape juice is not working so well. Um, so let's see what my T does. Maybe this one is a little bit up. Oh, just squeezing it out. My T. Okay, so I'm adding it here. I'm adding it to my bicarbonate and also not really much happening here today. I'm not very successful with my, with my, and I hope you're a little bit more successful. D. Here we go. So that gives you a nice red color. And E also gives you a red color. So the other ones uh, look more like a little bit of a brownish color. Let me just see. And I'll just have to add a little bit more of my my things. So a little bit of flour. Okay, here. Okay. My washing powder. That's number B. And let's see what they do with it with a turmeric. Okay. C. The bicarbonate. D so this is basically something that's called an indicator and this indicator usually tells you something about what we call the pH value okay so um, and when you have when you have this and you add a base to for example red tea or red uh, uh, red grape juice it turns your your color into a blue uh, into it turns your liquid into a blue color and we have e here so that's a salt again okay so let's try what the turmeric does no that's uh, okay so yes a Okay, I'm gonna add some drops here. There's, this is a pale yellow. B, let's see. 
Ooh, this is a beautiful red. So that tells me that this is a base. C. And I'll just have to move it a bit out of the way here because I need this one later on. Also a nice uh, red color. So that's also a base. Uh, D. That's a yellow color. And E. Also a yellow color. So also not, not a base. So what we've got so far is that C and B, they are both bases. So last but not least, we're going to test out and see if they react with vinegar. So, and you can try this out as well. My flower does not fizz with vinegar. My washing powder. Uh, no, not that I can see, doesn't fizz. Let's see if my bicarbonate fizzes. Oh yes, and I'm not too sure if you can hear this as well. So you hear this shh sound. Okay, uh, D, and unfortunately my sample is a little bit contaminated, but there's a, there's a little bit of a corner that, is, that isn't affected by the turmeric, uh, but it doesn't, definitely does not fizz. And let's try the sort. And the sword also does not fizz. Okay, right. So those ones are basically our evidence samples, okay, collected. And now what we need to find out is, and this is the sample that I took from the crime scene. So I'm going to investigate now the sample that I took from the crime scene. So I'm going to add, so this is one. This is for my indicator. Okay, so, so this is crime scene. So let's see what's going to happen. And I'll have to distinguish between water. What's going to happen with this one with the water? So it looks like as if it's dissolving. So it, my sample, my crime scene sample dissolves in water. Okay. Let's put this one to the side. Let's see what it does with red tea. It gives a kind of a bluish color. Okay. And I'm just changing it here. Let's see what it does with grape juice. Also a kind of a bluish color. Okay. And let's see what it does with turmeric. Oh, this is definitely a nice red color. So it is a base. So remember, we had two, two samples that were kind of uh, uh, that, that were a base. So one was B, one was the washing powder, one was C um, from, from suspect C, uh, the bicarbonate. So let's see what it does when we kind of put vinegar on it. And you can see, and you can probably hear that it's fizzing. Okay, so you should know now to whom uh, the, the powder at the crime scene belonged to. Okay, I'm gonna put this one to the side. Okay, so we've done the analysis. And I hope that you've already collected all the evidence and so on. And now comes the question, based on your evidence collected, who ate Miss Chipmunk's chocolate cake? Was it suspect A, Professor Albert Mongoose? Was it suspect B, Mark Turtle? Maybe suspect C, Sally Fox, or even D, Mandla Moose, or Miss Shireen Bobcat. So if we can start the poll and let's see which one, who do you think 
eight Miss Nolene's Chipmunks chocolate cake. So please guys, if you can just vote for it, whoever you think the suspect is. Oh, and I think we have a hot favorite here. Two, only three, oh my word, four. Yo. Four, are there not many, many more? Five, oh, oh, we have another suspect here. Okay, and who else? Come on guys, five people are missing, seven, oh, okay. So there we have a strong favorite here. We have a strong favorite here. And okay, all right, we're gonna end the polling. Whoops, if I can find it. Okay, and I'm gonna share the results. So the majority of you, the majority of you thinks that it's suspect C, so S Fox, that is going to be our culprit. Okay, um, does somebody want to comment on it? Why do you think suspect C is, is, is the one? Whoever voted for suspect C? Does anybody want to share their thoughts with it and what, uh, what evidence they used and, and why they think that uh, uh, suspect C, Sally Fox did it? I know we've got lots of shy people here. Anybody wants to share? Okay, apparently not. So, okay, so. Here we're gonna come and we're gonna reveal who it is. So the majority actually thinks, yes, it is Sally Fox. But somebody says, oh no, it's Mr. Mungoose. So we'll see if you are right or not. So the solution is the evidence for the fingerprints, so the whirly prints belong actually to Mark Turtle. Fingerprint number two to Nolene Chipmunk and fingerprint number three, uh, three to Sally Fox. Okay, so three fingerprints. Okay, so there's the evidence, victim, of course, the victim, uh, the, the, it is quite uh, obvious that the victim's fingerprints are present. Okay, so if she carried the, the plate and so on. Uh, so that's, that's quite right. Why, but why Mr. Turtle and Mrs. Fox's uh, fingerprints are there, we don't know. So that is very suspicious. The secret message. Ooh. Okay, and that was a bit tricky. Um, so it reads, Dear SF, NC has some chocolate cake, M. So if we think about initials, so that might be SF, might be Sally Fox. NC can be our victim, Nolene Chipmunk, has some chocolate cake, which would make sense. M, and there we don't really know what does the M stand for? Is it Professor Mungoose? Um, is it Mr. Uh, Mr. Moodley? Uh, sorry, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Moose? Or is it is it uh, actually a, a first name, uh, Mr. M. M. Turtle? Because Tanya, we have. Really... Say again. Oh yes. no, I was just going to say we have some comments coming up in the chat here. Uh, Jonathan Van Gent says added up all the percentages, which equals one hundred and one percent. And Marguerite De Bruyne says SF stands for the fox. Oh, SF stands for the fox. Absolutely right. Okay, so SF stands for the fox, and but we don't know what M stands for because uh, it's smeared by some coffee. Okay, so those ones are the indicators, and you're absolutely right. So good, good thinking. So based on the evidence collected, our secret message we can actually link to Professor Mongoose, maybe hmm? um, to M Turtle. MT to S Fox, definitely. M Moose, we don't really know. Yes, maybe there's maybe a match, uh, but S Bobcat doesn't, doesn't really have anything to, to do with it. Coming now to the evidence of the DNA. Okay, so DNA, things that we collected from the fork, from the plate, and from the cake. So the DNA from the fork actually belongs to our victim, which is quite obvious. Uh, if she already started kind of eating a little bit and, and uh, uh, 
there is supposed to be a DNA on the fork. The DNA of the plate belongs to our suspect D. Um, why it's there? Maybe he saw the cake and you know he drooled all over it, who knows? Maybe it was his old plate and he used it. And there is definitely DNA on the cake, which is very suspicious, which belongs to our suspect C. So to our Sally Fox. Hmm. Based on the evidence collected, who ate Miss Chipmunk's chocolate cake? So the white powder. So we had victim, uh, 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 so we had, uh, sorry, yeah, the DNA. So we, we could link it to our victim, to our suspect C and our suspect D. And now we're gonna look at the evidence number four. So the crime scene powder dissolves. Tanya, um, Jonathan Van Hen says not normal, 88% was voted for Sally Fox and 13% was voted for the other one. No. I think he's confused about the percentages because um, it was 101. Oh, okay. So, okay. Sorry. Um, so this is this is probably the program that, that actually uh, calculates it, and I don't know why it, it comes up with 13% because it's probably like a, a like a like an odd number. Um, so if you do your calculation, so if eight people, I think seven or eight contributed, and if uh, six say it was Sally Fox, and one says um, it is uh, 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 Mr. Moose. Um, so if you, if, you, if you calculate this, sometimes it's a rounding error. So I wouldn't get too worked up with it, but very good observation. And you certainly looks like as viewer Matt's, Matt's with fantastic for paying attention. Okay, right, coming back to our crime scene powder. So it dissolves. It shows a bluish green color with uh, grape juice and tea, and it shows a red color um, with uh, the turmeric solution. And when we add vinegar, it actually starts fizzing. So our suspect A with the flour, it doesn't dissolve, it doesn't show this color, and it does not fizz. Suspect B with the washing powder, um, depending on what kind of brand of washing powder you have, uh, it should dissolve, some say yes, some say no, it should actually dissolve. Um, it has a blue-green color, but it does not fizz. Suspect C, it dissolves, the powder dissolves. It shows a blue-green color with grape juice and red juice, and it shows a red color with our turmeric solution, and it does actually fizz. Suspect D, the cream of tartar, it dissolves our cream of tartar, but it does not show a blue-green color, and it does not fizz. And suspect E with a salt, it also dissolves, but also does not show a blue-green color, and it does not fizz. So the only matching powder that we found belongs to suspect C, the bicarbonate. Now, coming back to our evidence table, and I think it's pretty obvious there is only one person who have all the matches. And this is our suspect C, Sally Fox. So therefore, based on the evidence, we can basically say she's guilty. Okay. So guys, are there any questions? And fantastic job for those who basically solved the crime. Fantastic, absolutely fantastic. So, are there any questions? Is there anything that you are unsure, anything that you want to know? Ooh, I've got a quiet bunch today. So, um, I often get asked, oh, I want to study forensics. Um, what subjects or what, what, uh, what, what do you have to do and so on? Uh, so how do you link the white powder with the culprit? Uh, there's a, a question from Gail Robinson. Gail, uh, can you just... Okay, so basically um, the white powder that we found at the crime scene matches the exact um, chemical composition and chemical reactions to the white powder that was in the possession of Sally Fox. And this is often the case um, that, that scientists do. They use chemistry to link specific chemicals, to link specific powders, 
to to do a, 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 a like a like a kind of a, a, a fingerprint analysis, and I put it in inverted commas, the fingerprint analysis of the powder. So this is would be your your your, your chemistry um, that basically links it to it. So what might have happened is that um, under some circumstances she, she had some some white powder maybe in a handbag or whatever, and when she was handling the chocolate cake at the table, it got spilled on the desk. So things like this can happen uh, in, a, in a real crime. And so you can collect the evidence from there and then you can uh, basically check all the evidences, uh, so all the white powders that you find with the different suspects. And then uh, we, we figured out due to the chemical analysis that, that uh, the white powder in, in Sally's office basically matched the white powder found at the crime scene. Does it answer your question? Okay, right. Okay, so um, coming back to um, to these kinds of things. So uh, I often get asked, you know, forensics, what what am I do, and and so on. Um, so you can have, you can study different things. So you can be a geologist and later on become a forensic scientist by linking, uh, for example, rock samples by linking soil samples to it. You can study microbiology, genetics, and end up um, doing, um, you know, and end up in forensics. You can study computer science. You can study mathematics. So a lot of science subjects basically can lead you to forensics or becoming a forensic scientist. Right, and I see that we are almost done. Uh, I mean, time's always up. Uh, and uh, I see that uh, somebody really enjoyed the, 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 the powder analysis. Uh, I have to say this is also my favorite because I like the, the color changes and so on. Um, and um, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us. And um, I hope that I'm going to see you maybe next week. Um, I think we're going to do fossils, if I'm not mistaken. I'll, I would have to look it up. And um, if you enjoyed it, tell your friends. Okay, and uh, to join us next week, same time, same place, I would assume. And um, that is that was it from my side. I'm going to give back to Steph. Thank you so much, Tanya. That was so much fun. Um, well done to all our detectives. And shame on Sally Fox for stealing the cake. Um, keep your eyes open for more of Tanya's workshops. Um, information about them will be coming out soon. Um, my apologies, forgot to start my video. Um, uh, keep an eye out for new workshops um, with Tanya. Um, new information should be coming out soon, hopefully next week. Um, same time every Friday at four o'clock. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you again, Tanya. Um, and have a lovely weekend, everyone. Bye, guys, from my side. Enjoy your weekend. And um, you can try out some of these um, indicators, maybe also um, at home, and um, have fun, I would say. There's way more other white powders. You can try it on sugar and so on, so you can see what they do and how they react. And uh, as I said, enjoy, and hopefully to see you back next week. Bye-bye, guys. Bye.